to, to start off this talk, I just want to give a little bit of a background on myself and where I came from and, uh, you know, why I'm up here now. Um, so after graduating college in 2007, I went to the main, main media workshops in college to run their digital printing lab. I fell in love with the printing process in college, first in the dark room, and then I started experimenting on different paper subsets as my college actually got rid of the, the traditional dark rooms and started switching them over to digital printing. And at first, they, we were just printing on normal, just, just a, one matte paper in all my classes. And I thought I wanted to push it a little further. And so I started going out and experimenting with different papers and bringing them into the classroom. And that's where my love for, for digital printing came, when I could choose the right paper source or the paper type for the print that I want to make. And my paper selection really varies depending on if it's going to a gallery or if it's going in my portfolio, if it's going to be handheld a lot, or if it's just going to be put up on a wall. So that's where I started to fall in love with the printing process and then went to Maine to, uh, to print for them. And after my contract ended up there, I moved down to the city and got hired by B&H to work on their marketing team. And I worked with, I sat next to David Brommer. Everybody knows David. Uh, I sat next to him, and he invited me into the here when this program first started to talk about printing. And that's, he really gave me my first shot at teaching, which was really amazing. And I'm, I, I thank him so much for that. Um, I wasn't, I didn't last at b &H too long. I left because I wanted to be a full-time shooter. And that's where I started my career as full-time photographer and educator. And I, my work really balances between long-term grant-funded projects that usually take three to four years to complete and travel, travel work, mostly editorial and commercial work. So I have this kind of three different paths, teaching, grant-funded work, and editorial work. Um, so we're going to go over some of, my, some of my recent work, my recent uh, travel stuff from this past year, just to give you a glimpse of the way that I shoot, and um, then we'll move into the printing section. Sent to Russia, where I had to produce a travel story on the Moscow and St. Petersburg. And so I spent two weeks going back and forth between the two, the two cities. And really what I had to do was just walk around the cities, produce content and whatever I saw, and just make a travel piece on whatever I, whatever I saw, whatever spiked my interest. My, my style in this type of situation is to literally just walk around from morning till night and try to find interesting things. This horse was in a middle of a courtyard in uh, St. Petersburg. So I like to walk down alleys, and the alleys opened up into a courtyard, and this horse was standing there. So took that frame. Again, the, I like to push, the, uh, push my camera and push my creative process by getting out of the, the locations that, my, that, I'm supposed to be, that I'm supposed to be in and get into the more, uh, for this case, in the, when I was working inside the city, I wanted to get outside the city and find some stuff that's interesting. And so this is a really famous uh, flea market outside of uh, Moscow. And it's full of people, but I thought the architecture and the, the, the surrounding area of the flea market was more interesting than the actual flea market inside. So I just walked around the perimeter taking photos. And um, I, I got a lot of weird looks from people because I was just kind of in the no man zone here. And so people were shopping and walking around and, and just staring at me. But as a, a thing uh, that you have to know as a photographer is that you're gonna, people are going to look at you weird, and they're going uh, to think that you're doing strange things, but you just got to go out and shoot, and you got to produce the work that means that is important to you. So I just stood there and you know, didn't even pay attention to the weird looks to get the, the frame that I really wanted. Early in the morning, this is a, a festival that was taking place, it was Moscow Day. Um, I was drawn to the festival, but not the crowds of people that were at the festival. So I went the next morning, 
when all the street performers and the, the stages were being set up. And this woman, who was just practicing her skit, was standing out there. And I talked to her for a little bit. And uh, then she just struck a pose as I was leaving. And um, I thought that was the frame to really, to really round off this, uh, this festival. I thought it was a more intimate moment, a more intimate portrait with not a lot of people around. And I thought it said more about uh, the festival and more about Moscow City than, than just a crowded, crowded atmosphere of people. Again, uh, a lot of weird looks because I walked in there. Didn't, I don't speak Russian. And so I walked into the closed festival before, uh, like walked right by the guards. And they just kind of stared at me, didn't say anything bad or anything, like didn't stop me. Just, I kind of just put my head down and walked in and uh, was able to make these frames. And um, yeah, I think it was more successful than the, the, the rest of the festival. This uh, also earlier this year, past year, I went to, I was sent to India for a month to photograph the, the life of India, contemporary India. So I had to balance the, the um, contemporary India with the new buildings and the new advancements in technology and where people are, how people are living today with the traditional India. And so it was a really fun project because I f see a lot of work just coming out of, of India that's just only focused on the historical parts. And uh, to be, have the opportunity to balance contemporary and historical, you know, more traditional India was really, was really exciting project. Um, I love the colors there, the, the culture and the people are just absolutely amazing. So to walk around for a month to just photographing the, the culture was absolutely amazing experience. Um, again, I guess the story of my, my career is like getting up super early. So uh, Taj Mahal, right, right when it opened, I had 10 minutes to run into the area, take a frame before thousands of people flooded in. It was, it was uh, I think I got up, I think it was like, got up at three in the morning to walk there. Um, but I thought the frame was worth it. And I was lucky enough to get that bird to fly through. I hired him, actually. <laughs> and then, uh, then walking around the city, and this is just a, a businessman. I took his portrait, then talked to him after. He's just, uh, this is where he currently lives, and that's just his house. And so he's outside taking a phone call uh, for his business. It's another businessman who is selling these pots. And I just thought that these, this pairing was really interesting of uh, this guy, I believe he was uh, something in real estate, and this guy was selling these more traditional pots, and so it was fun to talk to these guys and get a little bit about their lives and see where they live. Uh, this is a staff at a museum, and this is a vendor outside of the museum. She was just, uh, she was sewing these, these pieces that she was going to sell, and uh, I just thought, the color of her clothes with the color of the background was really beautiful. And so I went to her and just asked her if I could take her portrait. And she got up and we, we talked a long time about what she was making. Yeah. What language did you converse in? What language did I converse in? English, in India. Oh, in Russia? So that's a good question. What language do I converse in? I'm, I usually have to hire a fixer if I don't. Uh, if I don't speak the language. So someone that travels around with me and speaks for me. And, um, but what's really crazy nowadays is that in a lot of these countries, a lot of people are speak English. And it's a kind of a mix because I always want to learn new languages, but a lot of people also want to learn English. So it's like kind of a little fight back and forth. Um, but, to get, but it is really nice when people are speaking English for me. So those are some, some work that I had, to, that I was doing for clients. And then I also balanced my personal work in, uh, with, with my career. This is a project I've been working on for the last couple of years where I've been photographing the wild horse populations around the United States. So there's only a few wild horse populations left. And um, working with the, some researchers in the, in the National Park Service to locate these horses, hike out into the backcountry, and photograph them. This is a 
these two horses, this herd really outside of Idaho was really interested in my camera. For this project, I've been shooting with a 4x5 field camera. Does everybody know what a 4x5 is? So a 4x5 field camera, and uh, the herd turned to me and surrounded my camera, and I was actually, I was too close to photograph them. I actually had to keep stepping back, and this pair just started uh, nuzzling and hugging each other uh, right in front of the camera, and so I was able to get this frame, and they were maybe three feet away from me. Um, for this project, I have to find out where the herds are, are located. That's where the, the Park Service comes in, and then I hike out there, and I often camp for a week or a couple of days around the herd so they learn to trust me, and then I, I can go and photograph them. Here's another frame from that project. Um, this is a lone male horse who uh, wasn't supposed to snow. I was in Nevada. And uh, we got eight inches of snow that morning when I woke up. My tent was collapsing with snow. And I just hiked out and found this male. And he just kept running in circles around me. And so I ended up using hand-holding the 4 by 5 to get this frame, which was um, you know, a, an experience in itself there. Uh, if you've ever handheld a 4 by 5 it's, it's, uh, it's heavy and it's cumbersome, but uh, it's really fun. So you can see where when I'm, I'm pushing my film and I'm pushing my digital sensors to really, um, really pushing the whites and the shadows in all of my frames. And so that will come into printing when we get a, when we get a second and to talk about the Ilford paper and how the, it's able to represent colors and tonal ranges really well. So, um, yeah. Finally, a little bit earlier in my career, when I left b and my first project was I bicycled around the, the United States for a year, photographing and interviewing Americans and their views in the environment. And then after that, I took four years to bicycle halfway around the world, um, interviewing the millennial generation. And so I was, during that project, I was photographing landscape work along the way. And this image is from uh, the Atacama Desert in Peru. That took us a little bit over a month to bicycle. So that was my day to day. So I had a lot of time to get a good photo of it. I, <laughs> so a little over a month there. The ocean's right here. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, again, just traveling and meeting people, asking them if I could take their portrait. This is uh, in the Adirondacks, north, three hours north of here. The lake was partially frozen, and I asked this man to paddle out in his boat and to break the ice as he paddled out. So the ice was really thin. He was able to push out there. And this is, I leave with this, I end with this photo of my personal work. Um, I think it's really important uh, for us as photographers to, to talk to people and to, to get involved in people's lives. It's the, the real reason I fell in love with photography is because I was trying to, when I was younger, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and who, like what, uh, what interests me. And photography was a tool to be involved in his, a lot of people's lives. So one day I'm hanging out with a farmer, the next day I'm hanging out with a, you know, a rancher, or, and then I'm back in the city photographing a model. And it's an amazing tool that gives us amazing access to the world around us and to meet people and to live lives, live people, other people's lives for a short period of time. I'm really interested in firefighting and firemen, so I and the, just their life, I think, is insane. Like how they they'll just they run into burning fires. It's just like so inspiring to me. So in this small town, I was hanging out, and I saw that the fire department was open. So I went and talked to the firemen and asked them, you know, like about their lives and what they're doing. And they, after about 15 minutes, they said, "Tomorrow, we're burning down a house, and do you want to come and photograph it?" And I was really drawn to it. I was like, yeah, of course. And so they said, if you stay in the town for one more night, you can come with us tomorrow. 
this farmer donated their house to the fire department to burn down, and you can photograph it all you want, and we'll just let you, let you have full access. So I woke up the next morning, went there with them, and they filled this house full of hay and gas and just burned it. And um, to either side of me, the left and the right, there's about 60 firefighters and 20 police officers and uh, a bunch of spectators behind us. I asked them to shut off their, their fire truck lights because it was reflecting on the snow. And so they shut them off for a short period of time for me to get these frames. And um, yeah, and then I got this frame. So that wouldn't have happened if I just don't go and just love talking to people and hearing about their lives and getting this access. Um, it was completely out of coincidence. And still one of my, I really love this photo. Um, and we're going to print it on a couple different surfaces in a second here. Um, yeah, it's a really powerful. To me, it's a really was a really powerful experience. Um, the it was cheaper for the the family to burn the house down than it was to knock it down. So that's how they got into the this thought process. And then the local fire department they they took the donation of the house as an exercise for the firefighters to study how fires work inside of homes. And so they just all watched and saw how, how the fire moves. And because these small towns, they don't have a lot of these, which is good, they don't have a lot of these experiences with uh, structure fires. So any training opportunities they had was welcome. So that's a little bit about my personal work and how I shoot as a photographer. But I don't know why this is highlighted. I'm sorry. I, I don't know why all my text is highlighted. So why we're here today is, is about printing and why we print and why I'm so passionate about printing. The, I personally do not feel that a body of work is complete until it's gone to some sort of print, whether that is printing a show or printing a portfolio, or printing a book. I, I, I think that we are, we are, this is coming from a photographer, we are oversaturated with images on, especially images on our screen. And we have the ability to just swipe through photos really quickly. I mean, how does everybody have Instagram, and how do they look at their Instagram feed like this, like really quickly, and like like something really fast? And so I think the engagement, our engagement with photography has, has sped up over the years. And a way to really slow down the viewer and to really encourage the viewer to spend more time with a pr photograph, I, I think that a print is the, the only real way to do that. And I'm going to go through the, the, my process of how how I print and um, the steps and the different types of printing that I do. Um, I first start off, well, before I say how I print, I have to say that color management is by far the, the first step you have to do in any of this process. Because if what you're seeing on the screen does not match what you're about to print, then you're going to be extremely frustrated with with everything, and your prints aren't going to your prints aren't going to come off a little crazy. And so, first and foremost, you have to calibrate your monitor before you even start editing your photos to make sure you're getting the proper colors. Because I've seen I've seen a lot of photographers that spend so much time out in the field producing these beautiful colors and this beautiful work, and then they go on their monitor and their monitor is not calibrated, and they're getting different colors different color problems and different banding problems and all sorts of problems. And so the first step is to calibrate the monitor. And uh, x ray is an amazing uh, company that can help you guys with this. And we'll talk more about their, their products in a little bit. Um, so after I've, after I've calibrated my monitor and brought the photos into my edit, it, image editing software, I make all my selects and I do a basic toning of my selects. Then when I've started to develop what portfolio that I want to produce, whether it's the horses or a travel piece, 
I then print out all of my photos to sequence them. And you might have heard photographers talking about this. Uh, it's a really old technique that I learned in art school. And I print all of my, my uh, selects for my portfolio, four by six, and then I hang them in my studio. And I live with them. And I sit there, and that's when I can start pulling off prints that I don't want. And I really think that putting them into print and living with them is a much better way than editing them on a, through a software. Because our screens, even if you have a giant monitor, our monitors are small, and you're looking at thumbnails, and you're really not engaging with the, the photograph a lot. So that's why I print them and hang them on the wall. And I hang them for however long it takes me to, to, get, to narrow down the, the selections. Once I narrow that down, I then invite some friends over who are trusted editors or fellow photographers or just someone who I like their taste and have them look at the prints. And they help me make a portfolio. After that, I, and that's my first interaction with printing. And after that, I go back into my imaging editing software, tone the final prints up to where I want them to be. And then I take it to the next level of printing, whether it's a portfolio or a book. Yeah? The four by six, what, do you, what kind of paper do you print on? That's a good question. Yeah. So that's when I start deciding what type of paper that I want to print the portfolio on. So I, what's the full name of the paper I print my, the gloss, the proper name for it? The one. Oh, uh, Ilford Gallery Prestige Ilford. Gold Faber Gloss. Yes. <laughs> But we could not make it long. <laughs> <laughs> so I use the, the gold fiber gloss as my, uh, my, as my portfolio piece. And that's because I like the, the weight of it and the texture of it and the feel. And a lot of people are going to be holding it. So if I know I'm going to be printing a portfolio to show clients or, or buyers, then I'll print on that paper. If, the, if I know the, the show is going to a gallery then I'll print on the paper that I want to show in the gallery. So, so the four by sixes go on the gold prestige Yeah, if I'm going to print to my portfolio. Um, so small prints, take them down, edit them down into a final portfolio. Then I go back into Photoshop and Lightroom to tone my images. And from there, I print the size and the style that I want for the final presentation, whether that is a gallery show or that's a um, printed portfolio. So, uh, why do you do, why do you do different uh, presentations for your portfolio from your uh, uh, gallery shows? Different papers. Yeah. Why do you choose different papers? We're gonna in a little bit. We're gonna print a photo on different substrates and so you could see on different surfaces so you could see the difference in the uh, in the um, in the image on different surfaces so it's all just a personal preference whether I want uh, some texture on the paper for the gallery or if I if I don't and it also is what the show is if it's landscapes I might choose a more textured matte paper where my printed portfolio for uh, Showing clients, I just need a rugged paper that ha that ha can be handheld a lot, and so then I go with more of a luster. So it's just really depending on who's going to be holding it and where it's going to be presented and the light that it's going to be presented under. Yeah. And when you say tone, what exactly? When I tone my images. Uh, so I that's just image correction, like color correction, white balance correction, dodging and burning, that kind of. I, well, I do a, when I shoot, I try to do everything in camera as much as possible. I'm not a huge fan of cropping, and I'm, I shoot completely in manual, so I try to keep a consistency in my colors and my exposures in camera so that when I get into editing, I can just do really small adjustments. Um, I do very minimal local adjustments. Um, the local adjustments tend to be dodging and burning. So the photo of the house burning, I had to I had to open up the snow just a little bit. But besides that, I do uh, 
universal toning to get them to a proper place, and then very, very minimal local adjustments. So how do I show my how do I show my prints in my portfolio? I think a I think that a printed portfolio really levels brings you to another level as a as a photographer. A lot of editors and a lot of um, galleries when they when they're looking at your work, they 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 really respond to a print rather than just showing it on a digital screen. And I think it's because we're looking at photos all the time on a digital screen. So by presenting your photos in a style of printing that reflects the type of photographer that you are, I think it shows that you've dedicated the time to your craft and dedicated the, the time to present this body of work in a different, a more traditional style. So whenever I go to see an editor or a buyer or gallery, I print and present them in this, this box. And um, actually, I need to build a new one because it's starting to get worn down. Um, yeah, it's fun, right? <laughs> So I present my work as loose prints. And this is a topic that you talk to 10 different photographers about how they present their portfolio. We get 10 different viewpoints. I personally like to do loose prints that the editor can then flip through. And why I do loose prints is because I find that typically when I go into a meeting, there's more than one person at the meeting. And they also, some, pe some people come late, and some people are there on time. And so however the interaction with all the people are, it doesn't matter. Because if the first viewer has gone through the first set of images, the second viewer doesn't have to wait, start in the middle of my portfolio and wait. So they can go over and start over. Yeah. This is 11 by 14s. And so, so the paper's 11 by 14, the, the No, the 13 by 19, and I cut it down. Oh, okay. Yeah. 13 by 19, so you cut down to 11 by 14? Exactly. And then what's the image size? Well, it varies depending on uh, the, the aspect and, the, and the, <laughs> the orientation of the print. So here's a, here's a, a vertical. So, for this presentation, I know that there's going to be a lot of touching and a lot of hand-holding, and I know that I'm going to need to print over and over again. That's the downfall of my portfolio, is that I'm going to have to print these over because they get damaged. But I choose the, the gold fiber gloss because of the, the weight of the paper and the feel of the back of the paper and how it reflects light so that I can, a viewer can look at it in pretty much any way and it doesn't really, the reflection of the paper doesn't really affect the image very much. And it's a really good paper for me to print landscape work and uh, portrait work on. So it's a really universal, beautiful paper that, that um, can take a lot of wear and tear. So, but back to uh, the style that I present the work in. The, I also think that editors really like to reorganize my portfolio and like look at it however they see it. So by having loose prints, I'm, I am willingly giving up the, 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 or, the order of the portfolio for them to rearrange. And that happens quite a bit. They lay them out on a table and they rearrange things. And sometimes they cut photos to look at how they would edit my work. And so that's a really fun learning experience for me because I want, I want to work with this editor, I want to see how they're seeing my work. And if they just don't really like something, they actually just push it off to the side of the, 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 the table and they're like, this isn't going to go in the show or this isn't working for me. And so then I know in the future how this editor thinks and I can have a conversation with that. So I think the, having the printed portfolio shows you the dedication, but it also shows um, it also gives another avenue of conversation for working with editors and gallery owners.
And I'll leave this up here. You can come up here and flip through it. I have two bodies of work in here. Um, what's also really good for me and my style of work is that by having a loose leaf uh, portfolio, I can print multiple portfolios and pull them in and out for whoever I'm seeing. So I am not stuck to a binded book that I have to show every, every editor. I, can, I have, over in the back, I have my other printed portfolios. So if I'm going to see you know, the, the parks or, the, or a wildlife uh, editor, I can switch over to that work. If I'm going to just do my travel work, then I can just, which is in there now. I, I like this size as initial conversation because I find that a bigger portfolio is just overwhelming for everybody, I mean, especially if you're in the meeting stages. Um, if you're flipping a book that's like has these giant prints and they get damaged really easily and really quickly and, um, and then it just becomes cumbersome to carry around and everything. So I print, I start off with the conversation with a smaller portfolio and then if it moves, if it goes to somewhere where they're interested in having a larger, a larger print or I'm interested in pre presenting them bigger, then I'll do a print that big and we'll look at it and evaluate it and then continue the conversation that way. If I'll hand sign them and addition them, um, but all of that kind of work, if it's necessary for like a gallery or something, is on a tag off the side. I, um, I, never, I never watermark my images and I never put text on them. I, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that the, you have to get your work out there and present it and trust that people won't, won't take it. And so that's why I'm not a big, that's why I don't watermark it. And I also think that it distracts the viewer from the content. Um, and then the final prints, I don't, uh, I, yeah, I don't, also, I don't put the location or anything on that. But I could see for some uses why that would be useful. So oh, now for those of you who do monitor profiling, uh, tell me why you do it. Anybody? Yes, sir. I'm with you 100% on that. Color management is one of those few things in photography that this device has a cost. That is true. There is an investment cost to this device. No doubt about it. A lot of engineering, a lot of good optics, uh, a lot of technology is in this little device and the software that runs it. But you're only going to buy this one time. If you keep throwing away paper and ink, you're going to buy this thing over and over and over until you finally buy it for the last time. So that's why we do it. We don't do it. We do it because we save paper and ink, but we also do it because we get a higher quality print. And we get a higher quality print because we can see what is in the file. If we don't profile our monitor, we're only seeing what the monitor is giving us. We're not seeing it optimized, maximized. We're not seeing the largest color space we could be seeing from our monitor. All right, so I'm fighting my, ah, here we go. Let's see if we can get this software to look right here. I have a, okay, this will be fine. All right, so what you're going to see here is that we have a basic and an advanced mode, okay? So I1 Profiler is the software that we're looking at, and this is the I1 Display Pro. Now, what's different about this and the Color Monkey Display? These, the two devices are optically exactly the same. The difference in the hardware for a Color Monkey display and an i1 display pro is the speed at which it reads the colors as they come up on the screen. The main difference in these two devices is the software. And with the Color Monkey display, you have a much more streamlined uh, software that's easier to use. It's uh, more intuitive. 
Uh, there's less options, uh, but it gives you what you need to standardize your monitor. So to give you a little uh, hint, so you'll notice when I choose advanced here, this whole panel over here changes, right? There's a lot more going on over here. When I go to basic, I've still got a few more options than I do with the Color Monkey uh, display, but it's more like the Color Monkey display software. It's very straightforward, uh, very intuitive, uh, very graphically clean. So we're going to use that one today. Now you'll notice, I'm going to do this on purpose here, you'll notice that uh, all I have all question marks here. And what that's telling me is that the software is not seeing any device plugged into the computer. So I'm going to plug in a device, but I'm going to purposely make a mistake, all right? And that mistake is that I have chosen here the i1 uh, Pro 2 device rather than the i1 display. So you see uh, this, this icon here doesn't look like this. It's a different device. So it's not going to activate uh, as it should. So we're going to pull up this device and away we go. Now we have our green check marks and we're ready to uh, begin our profiling process. So today we're going to do display profiling first. And what's happening is my computer is seeing two monitors. It's seeing these monitors and it's seeing my uh, LED. So we're going to profile my uh, color LCD and you'll notice that it has chosen white LED here. Now that happens to be uh, the correct setting uh, for my particular monitor. You'll also notice that it's defaulting to what's called CIE D65. Does anybody know that term? D65? It is. It is, a, it is a reference to a color temperature. So if we, we now know that daylight is 5,000 to 5,500, correct? We know this? But we use 6,500 for profiling monitors. Anybody have any idea why that is? Now, there are some people who will use 5,500 for profiling monitors. I'm not one of them, but, but anybody know why that difference? No, actually, it comes from the fact that D65, when LEDs and, uh, first came into being, and particularly back in the CRT days, uh, that was the first place you could get a really pure white on a monitor. So we didn't want to go more than that because we didn't want to shift things. So the standard throughout the industry, if you give somebody a file to look at on another computer, there's about a 99% chance they're going to be using D65 as a standard. So that's what I recommend. If you're sending files to someone who you know for a fact, if they tell you that they use D55 or even D50, do what they say. But all things being equal, D65 uh, is the norm. Now, our software defaults to 120 uh, candelas per meter squared. That is the luminance level, how bright the monitor profile will be. In some ways, this monitor profile is going to be somewhat subjective because it's going to depend on what light you're viewing your print in as to what, uh, how many candelas per meter square you're going to set your monitor for. Uh, I tend to use 110, 100 to 110. Uh, I find that 120 is a little bright, and what happens when your monitor is a little bright is your prints are a little dark. So it's, it's an inverse corollary, okay? So what you're doing, if your monitor's bright, you're darkening the file, then you make the print, the print's too dark. So if your prints are coming out consistently too dark, you're profiling at a higher candela per meter square setting than is appropriate for the light that you're viewing your prints under. Uh, the luminance. Luminance. Right? So I, I'm going to go back to 100. Uh, it just makes me more comfortable. Um, like I said, this is a somewhat subjective setting. 
Uh, when we were designing and, and developing this software, uh, we actually asked the engineers to put it down to 100 uh, or 110, and they were adamant that it needed to be 120. So we just said, all righty then. And, uh, and off we went. Um, the tone response curve uh, is, is the gamma. This is uh, 220 is the setting throughout, whether you're Macintosh or Windows. Back in the day, uh, it used to be that we would set a Macintosh at 1.8 and a Windows machine at 2.2. Uh, the operating systems have balanced out now so that the, the industry standard is 2.2. So now we will move on to measurement. And I'm going to set this so that uh, it's going to tell me, I, I'm going to set the, the contrast and brightness myself. You've got two options here, whether you do automatic uh, display control, and that means that if the software can talk to your machine, it will. Uh, and in some cases, you may get a better profile because, for instance, on a Mac, I don't have the settings. I can't adjust the contrast, but if it picks up the ADC for the monitor that I'm using, it will adjust the contrast. So uh, there may be times when this is uh, a much better way to go, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to do it manually. Now you'll notice that the software is saying, hey dummy, your uh, device is in the wrong orientation. So I have the diffuser covering the lens. And so this little graphic is telling me to pull this out and flip this over. Okay? And now it's ready to go. It just flips right over and it seats just like that. So this is for two purposes. It's to keep the lens protected while you're storing it and or to use it as a device that constantly monitors your ambient light in your uh, environment. I, I, I do not subscribe to that as a, uh, a way that I like to do it, but it certainly is uh, a good way to do it if you find that helps you. It is built into this device. So you pull this up, swing this around, and you have a felt uh, coating here so that when it sits on your monitor, uh, it doesn't damage your monitor. You have a nice big lens here. This is a characteristic of this particular device, this generation of device. Much larger sampling so that if you happen to have a couple of bad pixels in here, it will balance things out, whereas we used to have really tiny, tiny samples. This is a weight uh, that if you press it, it will move uh, on, the, uh, on the cable here. And this is what this is telling us here is to make sure that the device is sitting very flatly on the surface of the monitor. And we can adjust that by setting the weight so that it pulls appropriately, right? Just like that. So we want to look to the side and make sure that it works well. So we're going to say next. And what's going to start to happen is uh, uh, patches are going to start to display on the screen, and then the software is going to start giving us feedback. It's, so what's happening is the software knows exactly what RGB value it's sending to that monitor. The device is telling the software what it's getting, and then the software is telling us what we should do to make it better. Okay, in the, in the luminance. So what we see here is that my, and this goes to your Mac question. This is a very good monitor. It's, it's actually very uh, useful. I don't use it for doing fine edits. I use a, a standard desktop monitor because you've got the back and forth on a laptop. But what it's telling us is that we are going for a luminance of 100. And can you see what that luminance, the measured white luminance is? It's all the way up. Okay, so my, mine is all the way up. On a Mac, this is not unusual at all. It's reading 375. That is burn your eyes out bright. Okay, so anything that you edit on a monitor that's 375 when the standard is 100, I promise you absolutely your prints are going to be too dark. It is a 100% probability. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I like to count backwards because I want my monitor 
up bright when I do my email, when I look at websites, when I'm just surfing around and buying things on uh, B&H, online. Uh, you know, I, I like it nice and bright and crisp and punchy. But when I'm editing, I've got to be at the right luminance. So I'm going to count. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm going to give it a minute. I'm, I'm turning down the luminance of my monitor. Okay, so however you do that on your monitor, it's usually a button up here. If it's a Mac, it's for sure a button up here. If it's a Windows machine, eh. um, all right, so five, six gets me to 114, seven gets me to 96. I like to go high rather than low. So six clicks back is my setting for editing. Easy to remember. I go all the way to the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, boom, I'm back to the right luminance. Now I'm going to hit next, and what's going to happen is the color profiling is going to start. Now what's happening with the color profiling? Again, software knows exactly what RGB value it's sending to the monitor. The device is a very sophisticated device that measures what it's getting on the monitor. The device and the software talk. And they say, I sent this, but I got this. Now let me write a profile that makes these two things match as closely as they possibly can. They're never going to perfectly match, and I'll show you why in just a minute, because monitors are not capable of producing the entire color gamut that is found in a file, generally. Papers often are not capable of producing that either. So we have one set of color that the monitor can produce, one set of color that the paper can produce, and one set of color that is the actual file. So we got to get those things to match. Okay, so we're to the end of this process now, and our device is saying, hey dummy, now put that diffuser back over your lens because we want to... Um, make sure that we uh, keep our lens clean and pristine. Now, so this is not the actual colors that were put up and read. This is a representation. This is a graphic. And so now we are going to move to the ICC profile, and we are going to create the profile. And I'm going to call this B and H. Uh, LCD 0306 2017. Why am I putting all that in there? Because I want to know what that monitor profile, what monitor it's for. So it's for my color LCD. I want to know the date that I made it because if it's too old, my monitor may have drifted and I might want to reprofile it. And for the purposes of this demonstration, I've got a lot of extra light coming in here that I don't have in my environment. So I want to remind myself that this is a B&H profile, that I may not want to use this one if I'm in my home office. All right? And then I have a couple of other options here. I can set a, a photo uh, a profile reminder so that I reprofile in one, two, three, or four weeks. And the next question is going to be, how often should I profile? And I have a very simple formula for how often you should profile. I'll tell you in just a minute. Uh, I do not do ambient light monitoring, but again, you can with this device. My, uh, my particular view is if your light is changing a lot in your environment during the day, fix that. <laughs> right? If you cannot fix that, this may be a good option for you. So let's talk about uh, apples and apples. So I'm going to say create and save profile. And now I'm going to tell you my dissertation on profile reminders. I start with four weeks. Why do I start with four weeks? Because uh, most electronics that we are using today are pretty darn stable. If you've got something that's drifting more than uh, in a four-week period, you've either got what's called dirty electricity, you've got electricity that's wavering all day, or you've got a device that's not holding uh, its circuitry very well, okay? So these things don't necessarily mean that you can't use that device. You just profile it more often. 
Here's the rule of thumb. If you profile your monitor and you see a difference from the last profile you were using to this profile, you're not profiling often enough, right? So the goal is that we profile just before it has shifted enough to really make a difference. We don't want to wait until it's made a difference. So yours may be four weeks, maybe three weeks. If it's more than a week, you got a problem. So I've profiled so many external monitors that are similar to this that when I plug my computer into this setup, it pulls a profile that's pretty close for these. Uh, so you were having a different experience, yeah. a very different experience. Yeah. So in your case, it would benefit you if you were speaking uh, at this or another place to actually profile the monitor okay. that you're showing on as well. I did this for Art Wolf one time in Toronto, and I honestly thought he was going to kiss me. I had to run from him <laughs> because he put his pictures up on this beautiful screen uh, at the University of Victoria in Toronto, and he just was about to cry. I mean, it really was awful. And uh, I just happened to have a Color Monkey photo with me, and I ran down the aisle before anybody was let in and said, quick, let's profile that thing. And we profiled it with a Color Monkey photo, and it was awesome. So uh, that was before the days of when these devices would actually do a projector as well. This is so easy. There is no reason in the world why you shouldn't have this in your bag all the time. So. This, uh, the first icon here, gives you a graphical representation of the profile itself. Now, if you're used to looking at profiles, you'll be able to tell something about this. And after we talk about color sync and we uh, compare, say, sRGB to RGB or a printer profile to a monitor profile, you'll get a little better idea of what this is actually telling you. But what this is showing us is a three-dimensional representation of how many colors are able to be reproduced out of all the possible colors in the world, okay? So that's what you're getting on this one. This is uh, a representation uh, in two dimensions. So the first one was a three-dimensional, this is a two-dimensional, and you're also getting what your target and your achieved was. So our target luminance was 6,500, we got 6,623. You see where I'm going with this? We were going for 100 candelas per meter square. We got 118. Uh, we've got a pretty high contrast uh, ratio here. Most papers run in the 4 to 700 to 1 contrast range, and we're getting 1,150 contrast to 1 contrast on our monitor. So it's, it's uh, significantly more contrasty than our print is going to be. So that sort of thing. The next one is uh, a, a, just a straight graph of RGB. So how the three colors are interacting. And I will tell you that if you've got uh, a graph that looks like this from your monitor, yeah, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> any divergence is going to affect your monitor profile uh, in, a, in a not so good way. So this is a very good... Uh, very good piece of information we're getting here. And then the one that it uh, starts on is just uh, uh, a comparison of various photographs. There's a, there's a ton of photographs built in here. Um, so for it, yes, okay. yes. And so it gives you uh, a gray scale over here. It get, you can tell about your shadows here and you can compare your profile uh, to other profiles. Uh, that you had for your monitor. So you can go back and forth. So it is, it is a, good, uh, a good check. If, you have no, if you've never profiled your monitor, you're going to visually see a difference on that create and save. Uh, it's gonna, when it applies that profile, you will visually see it change. And most of the time, just one second, most of the time you're going to say, ew, I don't like that as well as I did before. <laughs> ew, I don't care. <laughs> because what you were seeing before was designed to look at websites, to look at movies, to look at email. It was not designed to do editing. So yeah, it was punchy, it was contrasty, it was probably a little blue, right? It's not good for editing. What you want to do is get to a place where that your monitor can show you what's really in the file, and then you can match your print output. That's the goal. So the fact that it looks 
a little more warm, a little flatter, quite a bit darker. You'll get used to looking at it that way, believe me. But again, I don't like it that way when I do my email. I punch it all the way up, you know, so it's 375 burn your eyes out luminous. All right? We're going to talk about paper profiles here in a minute, but I want you to look at these two prints. And I want you to, who can see a difference in these two prints? <laughs> Good. These two prints are made on the exact same kind of paper. They're made from the same file. They're made with the same settings. And they're made with the same profile. Why are they different? Because on this one, I downloaded the correct printer driver that allowed me to turn color management off in the printer driver and color manage out of Photoshop. And on this one, I was using a generic driver, so the driver's managing and Photoshop's managing. So you see that pink in the fire? Yes. That's called double color managed. That is something you never want to see. Okay? So that's it. So now we can talk about the good prints. All right. You got, you still got your mic? Yeah. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Good? Okay. So let's... No, you're good. Okay. I'm going to just talk about these. All right, let's talk about paper selection and what my my at least my thought process on what I'm what paper I'm choosing and um, and why for certain situations. So, do you have some blank ones of these that I can pass around? So, yeah. so talking about my friend was talking about being picky and the more you the more you get into this the more the pickier you're going to be i am extremely picky about the paper that i print on for the scenario that i'm printing on and i've done a lot of testing over the years to 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 develop a style to develop my style and how i want my images represented and so that really does come down to to choosing what paper I want the image to be on. And we're going to pull out some blank, some blank pages and just so you can see the differences in the paper. And this is something that I don't think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people do when they first start off printing. They, just, they go and they buy just a basic, like w w a one type of paper, and then they just print on that for a really long time. But there's a huge advantages to experimenting with different stuff with different surface types and different styles. So right off the right off the bat, you can see on these three pieces of paper just the color temperature, right? See how one is the one's warmer, one's more and one's cooler. So that right off the right off the right when I first start printing, I think of what the image is going to be and what color temperature I want my paper to be. And that starts narrowing it down for me. Then, take a look at the surface type. This paper is really textured. This paper is really smooth, right? Now look how, how the, the paper interacts with the light. There's a lot of reflectivity off this paper, and this paper just absorbs the light, and there's no reflection in it at all, right? So these are these are the this this is where I'm starting to think of okay where is this print going to go what's the lighting situation that the print's going to be in and what color temperature I want the the paper to to uh, to represent so with skin tones I I personally like a, a warmer paper for uh, if I'm printing portraits and I'm printing skin tones I think it it makes the the skin look nicer and. I don't, like, if it's too blue, then I, I think that the skin, me personally, I think that it starts to make it look like um, it just doesn't, it's not as appealing to me. The, the when I'm in a gallery situation, I, I tend to go more towards a, a luster or a matte type paper because I don't like a lot of reflection in my prints. So when a viewer walks up to the photo, I don't want them to necessarily see themselves in the, in the print, because I find that somewhat distracting. So that's another, like, just a t thought that I um, that I think of when I'm going to print the work. 
this paper, I've actually, this is the metallic, right? No. Which one? Yeah, this is metallic. Yeah, metallic. So this paper, I have, I've never printed on yet, and I've never seen one of my photos on. This is a, so I'm actually really excited about this. This is a, uh, the metallic paper by Ilford, and I, I really, I think of the, this particular image looks really beautiful. It's a little more blue than what I normally use, but I think that it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting pro approach. I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of saturation in these, uh, in the fire particularly, and the, the, the contrast range is, is really wide, and I really, I think that's really beautiful. And then when I was playing with this paper before, I was, I was looking at how that it's a little thinner than, um, than the other pieces of paper, so. I was talking to Brenda about how it could be possible to backlight this and put a really powerful light source behind and do a kind of like a, um, what, is it, what is it called? Light box. Light there it is. <laughs> Not enough coffee this morning. So the, put a light box behind it and maybe put the, the light source behind the image and make this kind of glow. And I think that would look really beautiful in this presentation style where this paper, I couldn't never. I couldn't do that. I mean, it's in a. You'd burn the paper before you are able to, to put a powerful light source behind it. So, that's the start of where I'm thinking of, uh, of the the paper selection I'm going to choose. Also, it's really comes down to, in my portfolio of, how people are going to interact with the image. Are they going to hold it a lot? Is it, is it scratch easier or not? And the longevity. So. I like a little bit of a thicker paper if I'm going to present my work loose in a portfolio so that when I hand it over, the paper doesn't bend. For this, it's a little thinner. And I, for me personally, I wouldn't use a thinner paper like this for uh, my portfolio because I could pinch it a little bit. So I know that this paper is going to have a lot more, hand, can be handheld a lot more and, uh, and um, get a lot more wear and tear so I don't have to go back into the studio and print over and over and over again. But also when you print on different paper surfaces, you have to realize that the image is going to be a little represented a little differently. So right off the, right off the bat, um, I, I have my, my calibrated monitor. I have everything calibrated. I have everything toned. And then when I make a print, I often have to make little adjustments based on the, the paper source that I'm, that I'm looking at that I'm printing on at the time. So the matte paper that's really textured, that was our first print off that, right? That was the first time we ever printed on that. I, that paper, I think, absorbs the, the blacks a little bit more than the other paper. So what I'm going to do in my, in my Photoshop is I'm going to come back, I'm going to evaluate that first print and say, like, OK, the colors are nice, but the shadows are a little blocked up. So then I'm going to go and open up my shadows a little bit to get more detail. And who, who has that print right now? Can you see? So look in the front, in the wood in the front of the house there. You can see that it's, you can see that it's dark and there's, I lost the shadow detail in there. And when I'm looking at this photo from this distance, it looks kind of like a blob to me. So I would go in there and make a, what I call it, it's a print curve and I would open up the shadows a little bit and make that adjustment. So we're printing out of Photoshop, right? Yeah. Okay, we're printing out of Photoshop. And so here's the, here's the general deal. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this. Again, I have written this on napkins. I have written it on um, programs at shows. I've written it on the backs of business cards. I've written this workflow on things and had people come back the next year at the show and say, oh my gosh, this is the most important thing I ever learned about printing because they weren't using their profiles properly, okay? So this is, this is I hope it's going to be the workflow you're using because if it's not, I'm screwed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so here's the thing. Right here where it says Photoshop manages colors, the first time you pull up an image, it's going to say printer manages colors. That's the one, ah, we do not want that, okay? Because that printer, depending on what mood it's in, might be doing all kinds of crazy things to your image, okay? So what we want to do is we want to take control of the printing process by saying, 
Photoshop manages colors, and in Epson print drivers, and please hear me clearly, if you have a Canon printer, you're going to want to use their utility to print from. I don't want to go any further with that conversation unless somebody wants to talk about Canon. They do have a very nice print driver that has color management turned off, but it is not turned off in their general print drivers. In Epson, you don't have this problem. So uh, you can print right out of the Epson print driver. If you say Photoshop manages colors, uh, then certain things are going to begin to happen. The first thing you're going to need to do is go find the profile for the paper, printer, and ink combination that you're using. Okay, so let's say that I was going to print, um, I'm going to go down here to my um, Ilford profiles, and you'll notice uh, that I have the gold fiber, where's my gold fiber gloss? I've got a gold fiber gloss for a Canon Pro 100, I've got a gold fiber gloss for an Epson 3880, and I've got a gold fiber gloss for the P600 that I was using here today. So I'm, I'm going to need to choose the correct profile for the paper, ink, and printer combination that I'm using. It does me no good to use a gold fiber gloss profile that's for the wrong printer, okay? Because that, it, it, may, be, it may be close, it may not be close, but it won't be right, okay? So you might get something like this crazy pink fire color. I've never seen fire that color. No, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I would choose, let's say I'm going to print on gold fiber gloss, all right, and gold fiber gloss, I need to go into the print settings. Now this is, it. this is Photoshop, and this is the print driver. These are two different things, okay? So we want to turn off color management in the print driver because we're managing out of Photoshop, okay? So we're not turning off color management. We're turning it off in the print driver. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go here and I made, a, I'm going to go back to my default settings. And the first thing I'm going to do is go down here to printer settings. And what it's going to come to first is basic. And it's going to allow me to set up my paper, what kind of paper, uh, you, the uh, gold fiber gloss. Uh, I use the glossy settings. Uh, uh, that's what's recommended out of uh, Epson. There are some situations where you might want to do an experimentation, but generally uh, uh, the gold fiber gloss is going to print on a photo gloss, uh, premium photo gloss paper. Uh, super fine, uh, 1440. This was a question that I got from uh, someone here in this room. Some of the printer drivers have 2880 as an option. Uh, very generally, uh, I, d I can't think of a paper right offhand that will hold that much ink, okay? So when you use 2880, you're doing two things. You're using twice as much ink, and the ink is expensive, and you're probably degrading the image a little bit, all right? So 1440, 1440 is one of the things you're going to set. The media type is the second thing you're going to set. And that's, is it glossy? Uh, is it semi-gloss? Is it matte? Right? What kind of paper? All these things tell the ink jets how to put the ink on the paper. That's why this is so important. Okay? So how to put it on is the media type. How much to put on is the resolution, 1440. And then that third little magic thing is color management off. Now we used to say, and someone asked me this, we used to say, turn off high speed. I don't turn off high speed anymore because the printers have gotten so good that they compensate for the problems that we used to have with high speed on fine art printing. If I'm going to print a limited edition or I'm going to print a gallery print or I'm going to print something that I'm selling to someone for a museum, I'm going to turn it off. I just yeah. want to have the very best. So the difference in high speed is it's going to print only one direction and then the head's going to come back print one direction, head's going to come back. If it's on high speed, it's going to print, 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 print. So it literally prints twice as fast. Okay? So nowadays, as I was telling this gentleman back here, it used to be that if you went this way, then the ink got put down in this uh, order, and then when it came back this way, it got put down in the opposite order. 
right? Because it's coming backwards. Now the software compensates for that. It actually chooses the ink so that it's printing. The inks are stacking one on the other at the same rate. All right, so where am I going to find my turn color management off? Well, Epson has conveniently turned it off for you. When you start making all these uh, changes, it knows that you're using uh, a paper that you want to control. So it says right here, printer color management features have been disabled as color is managed either by your application or the operating system. So here are the three things. Media type, resolution, turn color management off. End of dissertation. That's it. That's the whole magic. Right? Yeah. Okay. Relative color metric and, and perceptual have to do with the ways that the out of gamut colors move into gamut. Okay? So let's say that all the colors that I'm trying to print are already in gamut. It doesn't make a hill of beans which one to use because nothing's moving. But if something is really far out of gamut, like again, those purples, pinks, that papers have a hard time reproducing. If I choose perceptual, then as this color moves into the color gamut, it moves the other colors in relation to it more than it would at relative color metric. Okay? So what do you recommend as the go-to? Whatever looks best to you. Yeah. <laughs> on each particular print you make. Yeah. I generally start with relative color metric. I don't know right. about you. Relative. I, and that's because I know the colors are going to move less the, the in-gamut colors are going to move less in relation to the out-of-gamut colors. And that's what I want. Okay? But if you're, again, if you're printing portraits, this might be a perfect situation where you want to use perceptual. Mm -hmm. It's my experience that a lot of portrait printers, if they're doing a lot of skin tone, they're generally using perceptual because they want things to move. They don't want to have a blotch here or a blotch there. Okay?